What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, life's like a peach if you find the same. And right now, I'm feeling like a hundred grand. You are listening to Inspired Insider with your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise. Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs like the founders of P90X, Quest Nutrition, RX Bars, and many more, and how they overcome big challenges in life and business. Our sponsor today is Rise25.com, which helps service professionals, doctors, lawyers, accountants, coaches, consultants, stop just trading time for dollars and shift from one-to-one client work to -to one-to-many. Uh, Rise 25 is an exclusive accountability and group coaching program for professional service entrepreneurs who want to scale up. It was founded by my business partner, John Corcoran, and myself. And so you can go to rise25.com. What's interesting, Audrey, is people can download a free dream product ladder, which helps you map out your business on one sheet of paper. Companies like Starbucks, Disney have really well flushed out product ladders, so you can use the same tool. I am very excited. Today we have Audrey Darrow who founded Earth Source Organics in 2006 that manufactures righteously raw chocolate. And she's been on a mission to make, this is going to be a mouthful, but to make certified organic, vegan, kosher, gluten-free, allergen and nut-free, raw, non-GMO, no refined sugar chocolate. If you've eaten Hershey bars, that is none of those things, right? <laughs> um, and not only that, but may actually make it more affordable for people because I, when I was reading your story, Audrey, is a raw chocolate bar was $14 when you started and you couldn't afford that even with the discount. So you actually set out to build your own certified facility. And uh, Audrey's products are in over a 1,000 stores across the country. You can find it in... Whole Foods, Natural Grocers, and many more. And to top it off, you know, she is a um, a survivor. You know, she is no, she can't be beaten down. She is a 2003 breast cancer survivor. She's undergone radical surgeries, long term radiation, and chemotherapy, and feels that eating healthy is a major key to health. So, Audrey, thanks for joining me. Oh, thanks for having me. So go back to why you started this company. Because I think you were you originally started working at a health food store because you wanted to get back to health and you wanted the discounts. That's correct. So I, what I, was I going on at that time when you went to work at the health food store? Well, I had my oncologist, I had asked them a simple question, how do I keep this from coming back? Because quite often people that go through cancer they have a very high rate of occurrence, recurrence, and yeah, so for right. me, it was it was over seventy percent. Wow! So I, yeah, it was it's called a lobular carcinoma, and it's a very aggressive type of cancer. And so I asked him, "How do I keep this from coming back?" He said, "Stay away from white sugar." So that was pretty good for doctors who don't really know a that lot was, about that. Was pretty good <laughs> back in two thousand three, two thousand four. So yeah. he said, "You know, stay away from white sugar," and I just took it to heart. And so that's, that's when pretty started progressive, going, actually. Yeah. For that time. That was his exact words, stay away from white sugar. That's such an interesting answer. So, like, how do I prevent cancer from coming back? And he, did he give you a reasoning behind it? No. No. And he was a man of few words, a great surgeon. But he, that was the, and he said it very harshly, stay away from white sugar. Hmm. And it just went into my head and it has never left me and I thought, okay, well, what do I, you know, what am I going to do now? White sugars and everything. Yes. <laughs> White sugars and everything. Exactly. So what'd you do? So I, I needed a job first of all, cause cancer is expensive and I had a deductible that I had to, you know, while I was going through all of this stuff, I had bills piling up. So I went to a local health food store. There's a chain here in San Diego called Jimbo's naturally. And uh, I actually now and their vendor for almost 10 years now, which is amazing. But I went to Jimbo's in Escondido and that's pretty close to where my company is, you know, where we're situated. And I started looking at raw foods and I just started looking to see what was, what was a health food store. I had never really been shopping in one and what's available. And I saw that this little tiny raw food section 
and I th- and I, I looked at the price. There was there was a raw chocolate bar for fourteen dollars, and and I thought, well, who could afford something like this? And if you need to eat food that's supposed to heal you, because I had been doing a little reading, how am I going to eat something like that every day or every week? Because I certainly couldn't afford it. So got my brain working a little bit, and I got a job there. I took a job in their deli, which was incredibly difficult because my body just wasn't physically capable of doing the work. I had just had all the surgeries. I I managed to eat through for about six months. But in those six months, every break that I had, I studied, you know, I worked with the vitamin lady and I learned about all the different foods and vitamins and supplements. And it, it really helped for me to benefit me to figure out where I needed to go to stay healthy. And at the same time, I learned what was out there and what wasn't. Yeah. And what needed to be out there. And so when I left, that's when I decided I was going to do something to make a difference in the in the industry and make it so that I could create products that people could afford to eat every day or every week if they wanted to. So that not just the rich could heal, but also those of us who didn't have a lot of money. Yeah. And your facility didn't start off producing just chocolate or chocolate. What did it start off doing? I, w- I started out as a raw food bar because I think there was one raw food bar or something similar to it that was on the shelf. And I bought it and it was just disgusting. It, it tasted kind of like the bottom of, of an old shoe or something. And I thought, oh, wow, I could do something like this better. And so that's what I started out doing was a raw food bar but quickly learned – Within about six months, that raw food didn't have much of a shelf life. Yeah. So what was I in the what was in in the original bars? What were the ingredients? Um, there were goji berries and dried fruits and things like that. Things that you would find in what's now Lara bars and all these companies are making them. So yeah, I'm a trend seeker, so I always know what's coming out before it comes out. So I knew that raw food bars were going to be a big hit, but somebody needed to make them taste good. The problem was is you needed to dehydrate them, and we, you know, it just it maybe had I'd say a four month, two month shelf life, not much, and so they would spoil. So we we actually created a product, got it to my first trade show, and it was a righteously raw food bar, and I think my first ones were goji. Um, I, I had two others. It was so long ago I don't remember. But what was they, holding it together? Uh, dried fruit. So that dried was, fruit mm. and yeah, and goji's. I I tried to throw superfoods in there. There was um, some brown rice syrup that didn't work, and and it yeah, it, you know, the, one of the things I've learned over all these years is that most companies create products that they then have to go back and recreate and redo. Because I'm doing that for other companies now. It was really difficult to go through at the time, but now I realize that that's that's part of business, you know. And it it didn't. We actually had them spoil on the shelves of customers that were buying them. Really. And so we went back to the drawing board, and I had somebody in my facility that was making chocolate, uh, trying to start a business, and we started to work together, and we started basically making the food bars, dipping them in chocolate, and. That's how we came to our first three products, which were the maca, goji, and caramel bar. So are those... <laughs> I'm sorry. Bless you. Um, so are those dipped in chocolate or... It's it's basically a food bar that has superfoods in it that's oh. covered in chocolate, except for the maca and the rose, which have the superfood on the outside and the chocolate on the inside. Okay. Yeah, because yeah. when I was reading it, um, I thought it was like infused in that, but there's actual, it's it's almost covering the... Well, the superfood was such a high, powerful antioxidant content that yeah. we wanted that taste on the outside first, because maca, I mean, that's been our number one seller for 10 years. Maca, really? Maca bars, yeah. We, we can't, we, it's always, any store, doesn't matter, always been our number one seller. Hmm. And, Why is uh, that? Um... What does maca do? Maca is a root that's grown high in the Andes. It's a very, very powerful hormone balancer. It's athletes that actually ask us to sponsor them with maca. We have uh, surfers. We have um, snow uh, snowboarders. We people that want that energy boost. 
but don't want to get it through artificials such as energy drinks or things like that. So it's it's quite comparable to having that cup of coffee at three o'clock when you need to wake up and you eat maca and maca is just a natural and it's an uh, endurance enhancer as well. Yeah. So that first trade show, things were going bad. Um, and then you it, were, it went well. I sold a lot. You did. Oh. I, so it was just an accomplishment to get there. First of all, it was a huge expense. Second of all, people walked up and saw the name. So I knew I was onto something with the name. And they started to buy these products that were wrapped really horribly with my first little labels that were really bad. And that felt really good, actually. And then you run into issues like all businesses do, which is, okay, it's not going to last. What do I do now? That's called business. That's yeah. what I'm learning. You always hit a hurdle, <laughs> and life. then you hit yeah. another hurdle, and it's how you you know, are able to adapt to that. So the next iteration was you started dipping them in chocolate. We started uh, actually with molds. We did it by hand on stone. We didn't have any tempering machines. It was just a few of us, and we were literally making chocolate on a stone. And we went back to our next show in March of 2008. So that was when we launched. And that was, uh, if you can remember that time of year, that is also when the economy took Collapsing. a huge yeah. collapse. And we came out with a five dollar and ninety nine cent chocolate bar. And perfect timing. Perfect timing, and that was all we had. We didn't have any of our other products; just three chocolate bars. What was it? So it was the maca, the, the maca. So the maca bar. The let me see that. Hold it up a little bit. Yeah. Okay. Maca. Yeah. Maca, and then the caramel bar, which one? Can you see that? No. Pick it up a little. Ah, uh, there we go. Caramel bar and then um, our goji bar. So we only had three. Yeah. Like I really and... want to eat one of those right now. <laughs> <laughs> I know. We didn't plan this out very well. Um, and so we went to the show with um, some little bit better packaging. You know, every year it got a little bit better. And we started selling like crazy. It was amazing. And... For eight years, we even in a down economy, we grew and we grew and we grew and we grew. So, so let's say let's take the goji bar for example, right? You produce the goji bar at the you know for the trade show and for all these vendors. How many iterations did it take to get to what what you just held up? Like you started with obviously just the, the goji stuff, but after you dipped it in chocolate, there's certain iterations had to go through. Did you have to test the, like how many gojis go into the bar and how much chocolate? Like how many? Uh, it takes a long time to perfect a product and yeah. you actually do it over time. Yeah. To be honest with you, we're still perfecting the product. So 10 years in, there's still things that you learn from customers. Really? Like what? Um, What's something you learn from a customer? that helped you change one of the products? Um, well, along the way. So, for example, when I came out with the Rose Bar, which came out, I think it was somewhere around 2009. It was a very, a very important bar to me because it represented my daughter who had passed away in 2008. Yeah, yeah I'm sorry and to hear that. Yeah, I read about that. It's horrible. Thank you. Thank you. She's right here. So she's with us. She's part of business. Yeah. Um, and so there were certain ingredients in that in that bar that certain customers didn't like, some did like. And so over the years, we would tone down those things just by listening. So there in the Rose Bar, there's brown rice protein. So over the years and probably continuing more and more with a lot of the products, we listen to the customers and we try to perfect things along the way because – we want the customers to be happy. And so we listen. And, you know, we're not, we don't constantly change things. It's just that we do listen. Right. And when we hear enough you of see somebody a trend. saying, hey, have you tried this? Then, of course, we're going to try something and see how it works. So. so for the Rose Bar in particular, obviously, that has a special place in your heart. What yeah. did people want less of and more of? What do you have to, to change um, it, most of the people wanted the grittiness to be out of the product, and that came from the brown rice protein. And so uh, over the years, we've lessened some of that. But I've been very fortunate that 
the people, men and women, which always surprised me because men are sometimes not as emotional or, or outspoken in an emotional way. But I've had so many people reach out because of what's in the label. You know, my I, there's a little silhouette of my daughter, and mm. and it's it's really inspiring. And so that's really what I wanted. I and 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 even now as I continue to grow the company, I still have a lot of work that I want to do with this bar, and I want it to be in hands around the world because I want people to know that you can pick yourself up and yeah. and and move forward in life. Yeah, it's a legacy. Legacy in a yeah. lot of ways. Yeah. Do you have the bar there? Uh, can you hold it up? Yeah. Okay. Because on the page, and then is there, where's is the silhouette on the back? Because when I'm looking uh, on the I'll, website, I'll open it for you. It's I'll read it to you. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's awesome. It's um. Do you want me to read the whole thing? Yeah, please. It's, it says, "My angel Jamie Rose Darrow is the inspiration for bringing to you our newest addition to the Righteously Raw product line. The Rose Bar has been a project of love and dedication from our family here at Earth Source Organics." In July 2008, Jamie left this earth plane and has been my teacher, guide, and constant inspiration to send her message to the world. Jamie is now beyond the fabric that separates us from spirit, and together we hope to send a message out to the world and all who have loved her and formed. The message is a commitment to love and to connect to each other in spirit. With this amazing rose bar, we hope to connect and heal the world one customer at a time. And uh, please, see, you know, that goes on to say, please visit our website. But to me, the fact that you're doing this interview right now with our country in so much turmoil, it's it's added a whole new meaning because we've forgotten how to love, you know. Right. And that's something that my daughter, every day when she would see people, she'd say, I love you. She'd always say, I love you. Mm. And that's what I think we should start doing. Yeah, that's beautiful. Thank you for sharing that. Oh, my pleasure. Can you see it, like, it, on the inside? Is it, uh, yeah, what does it look it's, like? Uh, just a little silhouette. Oh, gotcha. Oh, yeah. Wow, that's pretty cool. It's, you know, I I wanted to do something that touched people. And it to just reading this now, and, and to me, it still holds so much energy. And yeah. it tells me, because this is what she wants. This is what she, oh, you know, she was a young girl. She was almost 20. And and I never I never saw her leave a friend without saying goodbye. I love you. Mm. If wow. we can just do that, if we can come back to that, you know, we can turn this country around. So yeah, yeah. I mean, for someone that's that's so tough. I mean, I can see it both ways, right? You preserve her and leave help her leave a legacy and by the world. But I don't know. I see that as also being painful, like a painful thing, like in a sense it's a reminder in a sense too so i don't know i you know when you see that so it depends so that's that's another reason why i do what i do is that you don't have to when you we all lose we all lose people we're all going to go at some time and we're all going to have family members and loved ones that are going to go but what we also have to understand is they may leave us in form but they're still very, very much a part of our lives she's such a part of this business i'm inspired every day by her right so, yeah. so a different way to be you can either make a choice i made a choice when she passed i'm not going to live in grief because not only does it hurt me but it hurts her because i know she's still around me and so that's a choice that we have to make and you you can go to bed and wake up the next day and go live in grief and hell for the rest of my life or I'm going to pick myself up and I'm going to do something really beautiful for the world and that's the choice I made yeah yeah well thank you Audrey for sharing that it's it's really powerful Um, so what is the first facility I mean because you went from working at health store then now starting your own facility what was that first facility like it was absolutely if I can't even describe in words because, of course, I needed a place that was affordable. So I found a place that was affordable, and there were people living in it with dogs, and it was a disaster. And it was like a commercial as, kitchen, or what? Well, no, it was a it was a building. It hmm. was a twenty four hundred square foot building, but coincidences for me don't really happen. Things happen for me, 
in ways that are very synchronistic. So in this, when I found this building, it was incredible the way it happened. At, at the night before, I was about to sign a, a contract with a big corporation that was going to be very scary when you're starting out a business to have to go sign a three-year contract when you don't even have a product. I was up the whole night. At 3 o'clock in the morning, I saw on Craigslist an ad that I called at 8 o'clock the next morning and had signed by 3 o'clock the following that afternoon. And it was just a man who had a warehouse that was 2,400 square feet, and it was a real disgusting place. But in that building, when I went, yeah, I, that's I what, Hopefully that's what the ad house. said. We have a 2,400 square foot place. It's disgusting. You're like sold. There were people no. in it. And yeah. And I walked in and saw something that nobody else saw. That's the way my father said to me. He goes, you saw something in here that nobody else saw. And, and people living in it who had walls that were laying in piles because the guy was dreaming about building a recording studio. Mm. And I saw those walls as a way to create my my certified facility. So I literally bought the walls for $150 and got the place all cleaned up and painted and wound up over an eight-month eight period of getting it fully certified organic, state of California certified, and use those will, walls to build a manufacturing room that was fully enclosed because that was important to me, you know, cleanliness and all of that, and had doors, and it was amazing. And I had exactly what I needed in that facility laying there that I purchased when I bought it. So it was it was a real synchronistic um, thing that happened, and with our bare hands, we literally built the facility. What, what machinery is needed early on? What did you have to actually make the box? Well, we didn't have anything in the beginning. We It took us uh, the first year to get us a, a, a bar wrapping machine, and that was that was a long process. Um, but we did everything by hand. Like I said, we made the chocolate on stone. We wrapped it by hand. Wow. Um, you know, we shipped it by hand. We never had machines. Um, the first year and a half until we started getting a lot of orders – and then once we, like, I mean, we I mean at that orders. point, did you have to like stay up all night or what did you do when you started getting all these orders? Oh, we worked really, really hard. I had some very great people that um, some are very, still with me that saw what we were doing and were really dedicated. And yeah, it was a lot of work. It was an, an incredible amount of work. And we did it though. We managed to get every order out on time and continued to grow and grow. And at that time, all we had to do was pick up the phone and say to a store, hey, you want to try an organic, gluten-free, raw, blah, 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 blah. Okay, because nobody had any. Right. So we, we opened 30 accounts in a month just walking in and going, hey, you want an organic, you know, blah, blah, blah. And that's how the whole first couple years really took off. Do you remember the – what was the first big order like? Oh, my gosh. Uh, well, to make you laugh, the first night of our first show in 2008, we had an order for 14,000 bars from a Dutch company who literally followed me – I'm not lying to you – followed me from the show in Anaheim – back to my warehouse in San Diego to place the order. Wow. And we, we couldn't fulfill it. We didn't have machines. We didn't, I mean, 14,000 bars he wanted. How soon could I do 14,000 bars? And my first thought was, you're, you're in Belgium. What do you want this chocolate for? You know, what? He wanted 14,000 bars. And that's when I realized I was onto something, too. And uh, but we've had uh, it, it was a steadily steady growth. So we'd open up an account and they'd take. Remember, I only had three bars, so we could we could fulfill that. I have 16 products now, so it's a you know when somebody orders the whole line, it's a it's quite a process. But back then, I only for a couple years, I only had three bars. Right. And so it was it was manageable growth because then we got our first tempering machine. And the maca bar has always been our number one seller since the moment that we introduced it. So what's a tempering machine? 
the tempering all chocolate companies use them it's how you temper chocolate and um it you can do it by by hand but it's a very slow process but it raises the temperature and lowers the temperature mm. and um so we got our first machine i think it cost us about fourteen thousand dollars it was a huge investment for us and uh we'd have to clean that machine three times you know to get the different three flavors out and over time we wound up with five machines because we have five different flavors so um but that's it was amazing when i look back now at how we started to what we're doing now it's yeah quite a difference talk about audrey the evolution of the facilities a little bit because i know you've outgrown several so you started off in that 2400 one right what was next and then the next one was about a mile away and it was a 3,500 square foot facility. I was always very aware of not overspending. Yeah. And um, so the, the second one, we only had one office in the first one. And we all worked together and talked over each other. The second one, we got a uh, 2,000 square foot facility. But then we got 1,000 square feet in a bathroom and, and offices. And we outgrew that. Because mm. by the time we left there after our lease was up in three years, We were using the facility of my friend next door to use the restroom for 16 employees or 15 employees at the time. So we we stayed through the lease, and then we outgrew that. We needed more offices, and then we moved. And the same uh, company that was renting us warehouses for storage, because that's how much we had outgrown the second one, they then leased us this building. Yeah. And so that's where you're at now. Yes. Okay. Um, so, you know, what's interesting too is the, um, getting into distribution essentially. Um, and you're in, you know, like we mentioned, Whole Foods, Natural Grocers. Um, how did you get into Whole Foods? Well, Whole Foods allows you to start local. Back then they did. It's very different now. Local means within 150 miles. So we actually were able to start in La Jolla was our first store in Hillcrest here, and we were able to go all the way up to San Luis Obispo for Whole Foods, and so that was considered local. We didn't have distribution back then, Mm. and uh, we never had big distributors for the first seven years. We only had one small distributor for Whole Foods Market in Northern California who we still work with. That's Dove Distributors. Uh, We never really could afford to work with the big distributors. It was very costly, and Mm. so we did everything walking into stores and selling it to them, selling direct. And uh, we still sell direct to a very good portion of our accounts, although we do work with a big distributor now uh, who's Kihei, and uh, we're growing with them as well. What have you learned from working with like Whole Foods and Natural Grocers and some of these major chains? How much time have you got? Um <laughs> It, it's a full-time job working with uh, chains like Whole Foods Market because, remember, when you create a product and you get it to the shelf, then the work begins. Right, exactly. And the costs begin. And if you're an underfunded company with outside funding, you have to be able to support those products. So you have to do the demos. You have to give the promos. You have to. It's a huge expense, and I coach people on that now because they think that they're starting – with enough money. Once you get in, you've made it, but that's when the work begins. Some people and when you know. better you better keep writing your checks because a demo is one hundred and twenty five dollars. You know, then you have to give away free product, so you lose on every demo. We weren't able to go around the country, and that's a huge problem for companies. It's still a struggle for us to make sure. So we do it through promotions and do the things that we can do, because you have to have people walking in to merchandise your product. Nobody cares about your product except you. Yeah. And that's something that people don't understand. So your question is, with Whole Foods, for example, you have to have somebody on the phone in every to every store every month making sure they're reordering. If a buyer leaves, you lose. The next one forgets you. If you sell out that maca bar on a Friday and they don't see it on Monday, you lose your shelf space. Wow. It's a on, yeah, it's a constant battle of – that's going to change with technology, though. I'm seeing that there's robots now. Yeah, going to start as Amazon, it probably maybe. There's good and buy. bad in that, you know. There's good and what bad do you see that. as a good and bad of Amazon well, purchasing Whole Foods? The, 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 the good is is that it's going to help 
small companies and, and medium-sized companies merchandise their products better and know when products are running out and, and are reordering because that's what causes a huge loss to companies. I, I've probably lost over the years 500 accounts simply because a buyer left. We didn't know the buyer left. They didn't reorder. It wasn't merchandised properly. It started out here at eye level, and now it's on the floor. If you're not in that store every month, you don't know what's going on. And so yeah. How do you learn the hard, hard way. It's very hard. It's a full-time job to manage those accounts. So you have to start small, start local, make sure that you do really well in those local accounts that you can see because you're the merchandiser. Right. And then you grow. And then you grow. Yeah. And you can see that, some of the pitfalls us, too. Well, the thing is, is that's hard for a company when nobody is doing what you're doing and everybody wants you, which is where we were. So we had no problem. Even to this day, 10 years later, I can open up five accounts a week. But I have to be able to maintain those accounts. Right. And that's the cost and that's the that's the manpower that you need. So how often did you have to call it seems like you have to be on these people. And even if you're on them, they may not even know what the inventory level is at, right? That's right. Because when I hang up there's so you, many products it, to manage. So That's the problem. You have to make a difference. You have to make, um, you have to make them remember you. So, for example, I have a, a, a salesperson who just got back from a trip to Los Angeles. He walks into the stores. He brings freebies. He brings T-shirts. He brings anything that you know we can give away, pens so that they will remember us, so that we can get higher placement on the shelf. So you you have to do that. You have to yeah. establish relationships with these buyers, and that's costly. That's manpower. That's boots on the ground. That costs money. So did you have to do demos too? Were you in the stores doing demos? Yeah. I, I still do demos. Yeah. I still do them because we need to do them. I do mostly my local stores because they know me. And, you know, we've been with them for 10 years, um, and I love talking to the people, but I have a, a people that do demos, and we found after a certain level, the demos will do so much, but then promotions and things like that, and free gifts, you know, things that have your name on, those are things that can also make a difference, so. What works in the demos? That seems like, diff is it just putting it out, or is there a certain... Uh, Things you have to you do to get connect. people's attention. You got to connect with people because here's the thing: at Whole Foods, for example, I'll use them because Whole Foods doesn't always have the healthiest shopper, as opposed to say a Jimbo's Naturally mm. or Mother's Market or, or chains where you know they focus on that everything is health food. It's not it's not a big broad store, and so Whole Foods Market you could have 95% of the people walk by and never know what raw chocolate is or what a superfood is. So the idea is to grab that person and ask them to taste your product and then explain to them why it tastes the way it does and what it's going to do for them. Hmm. And that's that's what a demo is for. And you have, you have five seconds. <laughs> you know, you to have get five someone's seconds. Attention. Well, most people like free food, so that's a good thing. Right, so it they're stops them for you. a second. Yeah. <laughs> so they're going to come to you and they're going to go, okay, what's free? And then you're gonna if you're if you're good at demos, uh, my guy is really good. Brad's amazing. I I'm very good. You connect with people. Mm -hmm. You share your story. You tell them why you're. They want to know why did you create this? Yeah. Why is this good for me? So what are some other pitfalls or challenges that uh, people should be aware of when you're doing this type of business? Um, out of sight, out of mind is the biggest one. So if your product is not selling and you don't know that it's not selling, which means you're not connecting to your customer mm -hmm. on a regular basis, they're going to discontinue you. And I, like I said, I've lost, I'd be in thousands right now had I had the manpower to manage all those accounts. So what people need to know is don't grow too fast and be able to manage your best customers because retention, it's taken us a while to understand this too. Retention is where you make your, your, your business grow. Oh. You can open up new accounts all day long. 
And that's what people think that that's the way to do it. I was in that boat as well. But retention for what you have for those accounts, staying on top of them, establishing relationships, doing the demos, um, that's important. Yeah. You know, Audrey, this is interesting because I, coming into this, I would never have guessed the conversation would go to essentially what I find is one of the most important things, which I guess it makes sense, but in this business, any business actually is keeping track of relationships, it seems like is huge. How do you keep track of all these things? Like, do you use what, what are the methods, like, there's softwares that you use or things? I mean, people can apply this to any business, whether it's, you know, chocolate bars or some service based business, also. You know, what we do, and it's costly, is we have people on the phone. So there will be three people on the phone all day long, eight Mm -hmm. hours a day, Mm -hmm. calling their regions, their stores every month, and sometimes in between if we have a promotion and staying on top of it. How are you doing? What can I do to make it better? Um, Hey, have you tried selling this at the register? That particular item will do better in this section. You have to be able to do that with each customer yeah. because they don't know where your product's going to sell. What uh, do you know? What do they use for software to keep track of all this? Do they use a There's certain? There's a ton of them out there. We actually just use QuickBooks Manufacturing. That is our mm. software, and we're able to see exactly what. Um, many people have told us that we could do better, but I think we're still considered a small to medium sized company, mm-hmm. and that's okay right now because we're working on retention and and growing within and organic growth Mm -hmm. but i think when companies have you know 50 employees and you know 20,000 15,000 stores 5,000 stores then you probably have to get into that you know crm software and stuff but quickbooks manufacturing for us does what we need so what do people recommend outside of quickbooks manufacturing to you like what's the next step for. Oh gosh, you know, I don't have a great memory, um, but there's there's a ton of them. Mm-hmm. There really are. There's there's quite a few to choose from, but they're all over the internet. So we talk about you know growing uh, facilities, right? But you've grown also in size of staff. And what were the key roles that you had to fill along the way? Well, you know, we we had to have manufacturing. Manufacturing is the highest turnover in any business. Uh, We've been very fortunate to keep many key people, but that's an ongoing process. It's a lot of work. It's hard work. And so keeping that manufacturing going and making sure that we have good people that show up because that's a big problem. Um, Our front office is, there's five of us, which is actually considered small. And six of us, sorry. And um, we're able to manage it. Uh, we have uh, a director of operations that can do a hundred jobs at once, which makes it really important. And the thing that also I really want to stress to people is, you know, when you start out, you have to do everything. Obviously, I have zero business acumen. I have zero business uh, background in college. I have a degree in physical education, so I had no idea what I was doing. I had to do everything. I'm the person who got the certification. What's really important for people to understand is that you have to do, as you start to grow, you have to understand what your strengths are. And quite often, ego, I guess, gets in in the way. So it's really important that people know that you get the people to do the things that are not your strengths, Mm. and you you stay with the things that you are good at. And that, that is key for business growth. So what's your strength? My strength is... I'm a visionary, so I'm the person that foresees the trends, knows the direction that the company should go, um, working with the customers, things like that where uh, yeah. th- that it's important. And I'm finding out as, as I'm getting older um, that the customer actually wants to connect with me. They want to know me. And, yeah. you know, I always... Oh, we'll, say, we'll show them this interview. <laughs> well, it, you know, it's right. sometimes... You don't know your worth, I guess, and right. your value. And so I've always given jobs away to people. My son works here. He's got a graduate a degree from UCSD in San Diego in management science. Extremely smart in everything in business. And 
and he handles a lot of things. Um, for me, it's not about necessarily uh, business 101. It's about seeing the bigger picture and knowing the direction and keeping the cohesiveness between the employees. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of things that aren't taught in, in college business yeah. that are essential for, for growth. Yeah. Um, talk about future trends. You know, I remember reading a very old article that um, you were talking in. And you, this was a, a while ago that you talked about a trend is going to be allergen free. And this is before people were talking about that stuff. And so you kind of saw that writing on the wall. And now it, that's obvious, right? Before it wasn't obvious. What are you seeing now that's obvious to you that isn't obvious, you know, that it's on the, a future trend in the kind of the health food world? Well, it's not going away, first of all. It's only going to get worse because we're not addressing the core issues, unfortunately. And by the way, allergen-free changes every year. So if, if, if I have in my facility this many ingredients, the next year one of those ingredients are going to be considered an allergen mm. because the trends are that we are not doing what we need to do at the core time for uh, when babies are born. And that's going to have to change because those allergens, those things keep growing. So kids that the phone calls I get, they might be out allergic to 10, 15 things. Mm. So that's not going away until we address those core issues. Yeah. Okay. Um, the other thing is gluten free. Now, chocolate is naturally gluten free and my facility is certified gluten free. But I don't make products that are gluten free, like breads and things. And right, a lot of that would products, have gluten in them inherently. A lot yeah. of products are being used by people that don't need to eat gluten free. Gluten free, in, in and of itself, is not healthy the way most manufacturers make it. Mm. Um, it's made with white rice. Because they're altering it. Exactly. So diabetes, which is right here right now, is going to be on sky high because we're eating all that sugar in those starches because we think, and you talk to people, you go to a gluten-free show and they go, oh, I feel better. No, you don't. You just think you do. And unless you have celiac disease, you know, I get a little militant sometimes because I, I want people to understand if you don't have celiac, you don't have to. There's, I have a wheat intolerance really terrible for since 1990. So you manage the foods that you can eat, but I right. don't have celiac. Yeah. So the diabetes is not going away. It's going to be above cancer in years to come until hmm. we get to the root of what's happening. Yeah. Does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah, exactly. So okay. what do you do differently now in the future or future products because of what trends you see? Well, because maca too I, is maca. I mean, now has become a little more popular. Goji, acai, all that stuff is, but before it was not, right? right. So you're seeing something uh, on the horizon that that others aren't seeing, right? Right. There's if you look at chocolate now, chocolate is decadent, and as we grow, and and I can't really tell you the things that we are creating to come out in the future because. It's something that we would introduce at the next trade show. Yeah. Um, Where do you I know introduce? The trends. Do you wait for like um, Expo West or something to introduce? Yeah. 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 It, so when I create a new product or upgrade packaging, I always make sure that it's done at the shows because not only then can my existing customers come, but I can show it to people from around the, the world. Um, there's huge trends out there that are not going away that belong inside chocolate. Mm. and they are not the superfoods that you think of. Um, superfoods are never going to go away. There are people who are always going to want to eat them, but there's many more coming, and some of them are right there in your kitchen all the time that mm. more and more information is coming out about. So what we want to do in the future is um, create products that um, contain some of those trends because chocolate companies, regular chocolate companies, are, I mean, they're putting everything in now, bacon and, you know, it's it's wonderful and so we want to upgrade this line that we do righteously raw is always going to stay as it is but we have other product lines that we'd like to create that will also affect people that maybe don't want this but might want that mm -hmm. we're not limited 
and we see that in our future. Yeah. We want to we want to attract everybody with healthy foods, not just raw customers necessarily, and not just chocolate customers necessarily. There's we're not limited by what we do, yeah. but we want to continue working on our line. Yeah. Audrey, I can see also there's um there's an art and a science to promotions and getting people to get the product. What have you found works and that doesn't work when promoting the products? Well, price is always, you know, people, it's really important. And, and I guess I could share with you the, the smaller products. So this might answer your question. So you might not be able to afford this at $5.99, even though we are actually one of the least expensive raw, uh, raw chocolates on the shelf. But I understand that. That might not be in your budget. So what we did over the years is we created items that everybody could purchase. So we we made little bite size hmm. that should sell between seventy nine cents and eighty four cents mm -hmm, retail. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. So that the average consumer that doesn't want to spend or cannot spend yeah. Five to six dollars, because I can't control the price once it leaves my warehouse. Which means when it travels to Chicago, and they pay shipping, it may be another dollar more yeah. than I want. Yeah, so it keeps going it. up, right? We've also made things like this that sell for a dollar seventy-nine. This is a chocolate dip brownie. Sounds Our good. Seller right now. I know I'm making you hungry. This is my biggest seller of all time, even. Coming up second on the maca is my chocolate dip macarons. Mm. So this is a product that sells. It's handmade, mm. okay. And this is a product that we cannot keep in stock, and it's a dollar seventy nine retail. So we're creating products as we grow that every consumer can get their hands on and try it. That that's my goal. That's what hurt me the most when I started out was that if I can't afford it, that's that's an emotional thing. If I can't afford good food. Because feeding yourself good food is very empowering. Yeah. If you cannot do it, it's very demoralizing and very, very emotionally difficult. And I was there. I mean, you're standing in a store and you go, I can't afford that. Right. That's unfair. And so my goal as I continue to grow the company is to create products for every type of consumer. Yeah. Those that want the decadent that can write a, yeah. a check for anything, you know, or yeah. those that only have a couple dollars yeah. today yeah and that's you know in the beginning when i mentioned the product ladder the dream product ladder that's exactly what it is right it's yeah people can enter your world in different places it's like disney's an example right you can enter in you can get the disney most people don't go and i'm going to go on the disney cruise they get a dvd or you know uh they watch a movie or something and that's kind of what you've done you built out like a product ladder like okay we have the mini bars that 79 cents and then we have the bars that are five dollars and then you can get a you know i think there's like a gift basket that's like 42 dollars that i was tempted to buy because it's got like everything in it but um you have different places people can enter you enter into your products at, at different points depending where they're at which is right. which is great that's that really important to me yeah because i've stood there in that store and i know what it feels like and it's horrible so i want to make sure that everything that i create in the future um it, it can attract everyone mm -hmm. i want you to talk a little bit about the co-packing aspect because not only okay. do you produce for yourself but other companies call on you to produce things for them too so how does that work well, so we what we do because we've already spent all that money and time to get the certifications because that is I've always told people having cancer was easy compared to getting my organic really? certification. Really? Oh my god. Oh my gosh. It took me so long and it was really difficult and it's very costly to maintain them because you have audits. And so people that want to start a company that may not have the wherewithal to build their own facility. Yeah can come to a co-packer like me and say, can you make my product for me? And as long as it matches all of my certifications, because if you come to me with a nut bar, I'm going to tell you, here's where you need to go. If you come to me with something that is not gluten-free or whatever, I cannot make it in my facility. But if you have a product that's in line with my certifications, mm -hmm. the benefit to you is I do all of the work. You just manage your inventory. And so now your overhead is incredibly less because my overhead's huge. 
but I'm passing that on to you, allowing you for, I think the cost is $500. Uh, and it's not my cost, it's the cost from the organic certifier. But you can take your products, bring them under my certifications, because I'm a certified co-packer for the organic certifier. Hmm. And I can make your products here, I can ship them to you and all you have to do is maintain a small little home office or an office, right. and I do all the work. Don't you wish you had someone like that when you, you started? You know, I created products that couldn't be co-packed. Yeah. That's the thing. So the yeah. ingredients that we do, and I do want to say this for your listeners, is we only co-pack dry ingredients. And that keeps us very busy. And the reason is, is we don't make chocolate for other companies. We're too busy with our own tanks and it takes up a lot of time. So for us, we do dry ingredients, whether it's cake mixes, whether it's yeah. So what? Mixes, yeah, what should whatever. someone come to you for for co If they're wanting to um, uh, make a product that goes into a canister or a package or a pouch or whatever, and it's a dry ingredient that has matched all of my certifications, or if it's not, we can work with you to get you certified. Then they then we can handle those. Mm-hmm. And then are there certain like let's for instance you're saying if someone wants just it's nothing to do with chocolate but just like goji berries with something else like a goji berry mix of some sort you can do that for people um I can do that. Yeah. yeah is there minimums of for that like do they have to there, order a lot for like depending on what stage they're at what i guess what stage should someone be at if they're going to approach you for something like that well, the good thing for uh, for people that are starting out, and that's the big problem in co-packing, is that when you go to a, a standard co-packer, the minimums are very high. So most companies cannot afford to sit on a product for that long. So we do have much lower minimums. Uh, we started out, you know, making we'll make 50 for you, but the problem was is we weren't making any money. Yeah. So we try to work with companies to to get them going help them get their, that business off the ground. We That's <clears throat> one thing for me that's really important is to share the mistakes that I've already made with these co-packers yeah. so that they can survive because that is worth every book and millions of dollars because I've already made all the mistakes. <laughs> I have to cough. Go ahead. <clears throat> Sorry about that. So that's something that we offer. We also offer uh, fulfillment. So we'll package it for you. We'll ship it back to you. Um, if it needs to go to a customer, we'll send it to a customer. So we do all of that work, and you can start small. I'm not going to give you an amount because we don't necessarily say it has to be a 1000 We try to work with the individual customers, right. see where they are, and see if it can work for us. Because I would take everybody if I could. Yeah. You know, I, I want yeah. everybody to have the opportunity to build yeah. their dream. So. Yeah. You're, you're busy enough as it is, so I, I can assume you can't. Well, you know but, what I mean? but I've so. learned over time, here's the thing you have to learn in business, which you'd think you'd know this, you got to make money. You have to make money in order to stay in business. I'm responsible to people. And I've spent many years wanting to help others, but at the same time I've had to learn the hard way. I have to make profit or I can't help others. Yeah. So hundred percent. Yeah. yeah. Um, I'll be, I want to be the first one to thank you. Thank you for taking the time. Thank you for talking oh, right. about, right. um, the journey and where should we point people towards to find out more? Obviously they can go to different grocery stores, whole foods, local, if it's, if it's there, but they could also go to your website, which, uh, is righteously raw chocolate.com and check out um, the products, the mini bites, the macaroons, the full size bars, all that. Um, are there any other places we should point people towards to check out to uh, check out your products? Well, they can always email me. They can just the email that's on the website will come to me. It's info at earthsourceorganics.com. They can also, if anybody has questions, they want to give us a call. Uh, we're here, you know, five days a week, and it's uh, 760-734-1867. Um, and they can talk to anybody here about our products or if they want to talk about co-packing or anything like that. Um, you know, we're here, to, we're here to talk and help people. Yeah. So what do we miss? Anything else from the journey that would be important to leave people with? I think... 
for me, it's really important that people know that the, the journey of business for me has been an incredible experience and that if you're starting out in a business, you have to understand that those problems along the way, which happen in business all the time, are actually what I call lessons. And so you can be in business and you can go, oh my gosh, this isn't going to work. Why me? Hurdle, 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 which is business. Or you can look at it and go, what am I supposed to learn from this? It's taken me a long time to figure that out. So now when I'm faced with those hurdles, I can look at it and go, okay, what do I need to learn from this? And then I do, and I move on to the next one. That, for anybody starting a business, that is crucial to understand. And the other part of it is if I inspire one of your viewers by knowing that after cancer, after loss, you can pick yourself up and you can still dream and you can still have joy and you can still have laughter and you can still create. And that in and of itself is what gets me up every day. Yep. If I didn't have this dream and this vision, you know, I'm 60 years old, almost 61, and I'll tell you something. I spent my entire life thinking that I was tone deaf because I was told I was tone deaf. And about two years ago, I thought, what if I'm, what if I'm not? Hmm. And I started playing guitar. Got a guitar teacher who said, well, yes, you can. And I found that one person that can say, yes, you can. Do you know I'm a drummer, a guitarist? I play electric guitar. I play, I play with bands. I'm learning bass guitar now. So if I can inspire one person to know that we are not what we were told we were hmm. and to go out and, f and do what it is that you've always dreamed of, don't let anybody put a label on you. I'm 61 years old. I'm playing in bands now of, th of something that I spent all my life. And that is so important for me, for me, for people to understand. Yeah. Audrey, thank you again. Everyone check out RighteouslyRawChocolate.com. And uh, this is great. Thank you so much. What an honor. What I've got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, life's like a beach if you find the sand. And right now, I'm feeling like a hundred grand.